Chapter 10, Energy, the Fuel of Excellence I call energy the fuel of excellence. You can change your internal representations all day long, but if your biochemistry is messed up, it's going to make the brain create distorted representations. It's going to throw off the whole system. In fact, it's highly unlikely you'll even feel like using what you've learned. You could have the most beautiful race car in the world, but if you try to run it on beer, it's not going to work. You can have the right car and the right fuel, but if the spark plugs are not firing right, you won't get peak performance. In this chapter, I'm going to share some thoughts about energy and how to raise it to peak levels. The higher the energy level, the more efficient your body. The more efficient your body, the better you feel and the more you will use your talent to produce outstanding results. I'm going to give you six keys to a powerful, indomitable physiology. Much of what I say will challenge things you've always believed. Some of it will go against the notions you now have of good health. But these six principles have worked spectacularly for me and the people I've worked with, as well as thousands of others who practice a science of health called natural hygiene. Apply all six principles for 10 to 30 days and judge their validity by the results they produce in your body rather than by what you may have been educated to believe. Understand how your body works, respect it, and take care of it, and it will take care of you. You've been learning to run your own brain. Now you must learn how to run your body. Let's start with the first key to living health, the power of breath. The foundation of health is a healthy bloodstream, the system that transports oxygen and nutrients to all the cells of your body. If you have a healthy circulation system, you're going to live a long, healthy life. What is the control button for that system? Breathing. It's the way you fully oxygenate the body and thus stimulate the electrical process of each and every cell. Breathing not only controls the oxygenation of the cells. It also controls the flow of lymph fluid, which contains white blood cells to protect the body. What is the lymph system? Some people think of it as the body's sewage system. Every cell in your body is surrounded by lymph. You have four times as much lymph fluid in your body as you do blood. The body's cells depend on the lymph system as the only way to drain off the large toxic materials and excess fluid, which restrict the amount of oxygen. The fluid passes through the lymph nodes, where dead cells and all other poisons except blood proteins are neutralized and destroyed. The bloodstream has a pump, your heart. But the lymph system doesn't have one. The only way lymph moves is through deep breathing and muscular movement. So if you want to have a healthy bloodstream with effective lymph and immune systems, you need to breathe deeply and produce the movements that will stimulate them. Dr. Jack Shields, a highly regarded lymphologist from Santa Barbara, California, recently conducted an interesting study of the immune system. He put cameras inside people's bodies to see what stimulated cleansing of the lymph system. He found that a deep diaphragmatic breath is the most effective way to accomplish this. It creates something like a vacuum that sucks lymph through the bloodstream and multiplies the pace at which the body eliminates toxins. In fact, deep breathing and exercise can accelerate this process by as much as 15 times. If you get nothing else from this chapter but an understanding of the importance of deep breathing, you could dramatically increase the level of your body's health. The other essential component of healthy overall breathing is daily aerobic exercise. Aerobic literally means to exercise with air. Build a solid foundation before you begin to jog or jump up and down. If you exercise properly, you will be able to breathe deeply and continue until you have had a good workout. The second key is the principle of eating water-rich foods. 70% of the planet is covered with water. 80% of your body is made up of water. What do you think a large percentage of your diet should contain? You need to make certain that 70% of your diet is made up of foods that are rich in water. That means fresh fruits or vegetables, or their juices freshly squeezed. Some people recommend drinking from 8 to 12 glasses of water a day to flush out the system. Do you know how crazy that is? In the first place, most of our water isn't so great. Chances are it contains chlorine, fluoride, minerals, and other toxic substances. Drinking distilled water is usually the best idea. But no matter what kind of water you drink, you can't cleanse your system by drowning it. Instead of trying to flush your system by flooding it with water, all you have to do is eat foods that are naturally rich in water. 
There are only three kinds on the planet, fruits, vegetables, and sprouts. These will provide you with an abundance of water, the life-giving, cleansing substance. When people live on a diet that is low in water content foods, an unhealthy functioning of the body is almost guaranteed. As Alexander Bryce, MD, states in his book The Laws of Life and Health, when too little fluid is supplied, the blood maintains a higher specific gravity and the poisonous waste products of tissue or cell change are only cast off very imperfectly. The body is, therefore, poisoned by its own excretions, and it is not too much to say that the chief reason of this is because a sufficient amount of fluid has not been supplied to carry off in solution the waste matter the cells manufacture. Your diet should be consistently assisting your body with the process of cleansing, rather than burdening it with indigestible foodstuff. The buildup of waste products within the body promotes disease. One way to keep the bloodstream and body as free as possible from wastes and toxic poisons is to limit ingestion of those foods or non-foods that strain the eliminative organs of the body, the other is to provide enough water to the system to assist in the dilution and elimination of such wastes. Remember, the quality of your life is dependent upon the quality of the life of your cells. If the bloodstream is filled with waste products, the resulting environment does not promote a strong, vibrant, healthy cell life, nor a biochemistry capable of creating a balanced emotional life for an individual. The third key to living health is the principle of effective food combining. Some people turn food combining into something very complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. Some foods should not be eaten with others. Different types of foods require different types of digestive juices, and not all digestive juices are compatible. Different foods are digested differently. Starchy foods, rice, bread, potatoes, and so on, require an alkaline digestive medium, which is initially supplied in the mouth by the enzyme tylen. Protein foods, meat, dairy, nuts, seeds, and the like, require an acid medium for digestion, hydrochloric acid and pepsin. Now it is a law of chemistry that two contrary mediums, acid and alkali, cannot work at the same time. They neutralize each other. If you eat a protein with a starch, digestion is impaired or completely arrested. Undigested food becomes soil for bacteria, which ferment and decompose it, giving rise to digestive disorders and gas. Incompatible food combinations rob you of energy, and anything that produces a loss of energy is potentially disease-producing. It creates excess acid, which causes the blood to thicken and thus move more slowly through the system, robbing the body of oxygen. Remember how you felt after you dragged yourself from Thanksgiving dinner last year? How conducive is that to good health, to a healthy bloodstream, to an energetic physiology? Do you wake up tired in the morning, even after 6 or 7 or 8 hours of sleep? Know why? While you're sleeping, your body is working overtime to digest the incompatible combinations of food you've put in your stomach. When foods are properly combined, the body is able to do its job effectively, and digestion lasts an average of 3 to 4 hours, so you don't have to waste your energy on digestion. Let's go on to the fourth key, the law of controlled consumption. Do you love to eat? So do I, want to learn how to eat a lot? Here it is, eat a little. That way, you'll be around long enough to eat a lot. Medical study after medical study has shown the same thing. The surest way to increase an animal's lifespan is to cut down on the amount of food it eats. Dr. Clive McKay conducted one famous study at Cornell University. In his experiment, he took laboratory rats and cut their food intake in half. It doubled their lifespan. One follow-up study done by Dr. Edward J. Massaro at the University of Texas was even more interesting. Massaro worked with three groups of rats, one group ate as much as it wanted, a second group had its food intake cut by 60%, and the third group was able to eat as much as it wanted, but its protein intake was cut in half. After 810 days, only 13% of the first group remained alive. Of the second group whose food consumption was cut by 60%, 97% were still alive. Of the third group where food intake remained high, but protein consumption was cut in half, 50% were still alive. Dr. Ray Walford, a famous UCLA researcher, concluded, 
Undernutrition is thus far the only method we know of that consistently retards the aging process and extends the maximum lifespan of warm-blooded animals. These studies are undoubtedly applicable to humans because it works in every species studied thus far. The studies show that physiological deterioration, including the normal deterioration of the immune system, was markedly delayed by food restriction. So the message is simple and clear, eat less, live more. The fifth key to the living health program is the principle of effective fruit consumption. Fruit is the most perfect food. It takes the least amount of energy to digest and gives your body the most in return. The only food your brain can work on is glucose. Fruit is primarily fructose, which can be easily converted into glucose, and it's most often 90 to 95% water. That means it's cleansing and nurturing at the same time. The only problem with fruit is that most people don't know how to eat it in a way that allows the body effectively to use its nutrients. You must always eat fruit on an empty stomach. Why? The reason is that fruit is not primarily digested in the stomach. It digests in the small intestine. Fruit is designed to go right through the stomach in a few minutes and into the intestines, where it releases its sugars. But if there is meat or potatoes or starch in the stomach, the fruit gets trapped there and begins to ferment. Did you ever eat some fruit for dessert after a big meal and find yourself burping the uncomfortable aftertaste for the rest of the evening? The reason is you didn't eat it properly. You must always eat fruit on an empty stomach. The best kind of fruit is fresh fruit or freshly squeezed fruit juice. You don't want to drink juice right out of a can or glass container. Much of the time the juice has been heated in the sealing process, and its structure has become acidic. Dr. William Castillo, head of the famed Framington, Massachusetts, Heart Study, has stated that fruit is the finest food you could possibly eat to protect yourself against heart disease. He said fruit contains bioflavonoids, which keep the blood from thickening and plugging up the arteries. It also strengthens the capillaries, and weak capillaries often lead to internal bleeding and heart attacks. The sixth key to living health is the protein myth. No one really has any idea how much protein we need. After 10 years of studying human protein ingestion needs, Dr. Mark Higstead, past professor of nutrition at Harvard Medical School, confirmed the fact that most human beings seem to adapt to whatever protein intake is available to them. The National Academy of Sciences says that the adult American male needs 56 grams of protein a day. We called the National Academy of Sciences and asked how they arrived at the figure of 56 grams. In fact, their own literature says we only need 30, but they recommend 56. Now they also say that excess protein intake overworks the urinary tract and causes fatigue. So why do they recommend even more than they say we need? We're still waiting for a good answer. They simply told us they used to recommend 80 grams, but when they decided to lower it, they were met with a huge public outcry. From whom? Did you or I call in to complain? Not likely. The outcry came from vested interests who earn their livelihood through the sale of high-protein foods and products. What's the greatest marketing plan on earth? It's making people think they'll die unless they use your product. That's exactly what has happened with protein. Let's analyze this correctly. What about the idea that you need protein for energy? What does your body use for energy? First it uses glucose from fruits, vegetables, and sprouts. Then it uses starch. Then it uses fat. The last thing it ever uses for energy is protein. How about the idea that protein helps build endurance? Excess protein provides the body with excess nitrogen, which causes fatigue. Bodybuilders all pumped up with protein are not known for their marathon running abilities. Well. What about protein building strong bones? It's the opposite. Too much protein has been linked continuously to osteoporosis, the softening and weakening of bones. The strongest bones on the planet belong to vegetarians. If you look to nature and you see the biggest and most powerful animals such as gorillas, elephants, rhinoceroses, and so on, you'll discover they're herbivores. If you absolutely must eat meat, this is what you should do. First, Get it from a source that guarantees it's pasture grazed, that is, a source that guarantees it doesn't have growth hormones. Second, drastically cut your intake. Make your new maximum one serving of meat per day. 
I'm not saying that simply by not eating meat you will be healthy, nor am I saying if you do eat meat, you cannot be healthy. Neither of these two statements would be true. Many meat eaters are healthier than vegetarians simply because some vegetarians have a tendency to believe that if they don't eat meat, they can eat anything else. I'm certainly not advocating that. This whole book is designed for you to take in information, decide what you think is useful, and throw away what you find doesn't work. However, why not test all the principles before you judge them? Try the six principles of the living health system for the next 10 to 30 days, or for your lifetime, and judge for yourself if they produce higher levels of energy and a feeling of vibrancy that supports you in all you do. The six keys in this chapter can be yours to use to create the experience of health you desire. Take a moment and imagine yourself a month from now having actually followed the principles and concepts we've talked about. See the person you will be after having changed your biochemistry by eating and breathing effectively. What if you started your day by taking 10 deep, clean, powerful breaths that invigorated your whole system? What if you began every day feeling alert and joyful and in control of your body? What if you began combining foods properly so your energy was available for the things that really mattered? What if you went to bed every night feeling you had experienced the total vibrancy that allowed you to be all you could be? What if you felt as if you were living health, and you had energy you never dreamed was possible? If you look at that person and like what you see, then everything I'm offering you is easily within your grasp. It takes only a little discipline, not too much, because once you break your old habits, you'll never go back. For every disciplined effort there is a multiple reward. So if you like what you see, do it. Start today and it will change your life forever. Now that you know how to put yourself in the finest state for producing results, let's discover. Chapter 11, Limitation Disengage, What Do You Want?